This week we are continuing in our series. We are in week two of Holy Habits. And if you missed the first one, you can always catch it again on our YouTube. Did you know we have a YouTube channel? Sometimes I'm like, what, we have a YouTube Yeah, we have a YouTube channel and uh, Spotify channels. And you can actually catch up on what you've already missed. Because you know what I want for you is I want you to come and grow and go with us. I don't want you to miss out on what God's trying to say to this house. If you call this place home, man, I don't want you to miss out on that. So jump in there and see what God's trying to say to you. But in this series, we are learning what it means to live a holy life that reflects and represents our holy God. That's what we're learning about. And last week, we kicked off the series with the idea that in order of us, for us to do that, we've got to first know and remember who we are. Do you remember that? And because uh, until we know who we are as holy people, we'll never be able to live out our calling, to live holy lives, to represent our living God, our holy God. Like, you got to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Like, when you really know God, you will begin to know who you are in Christ Jesus. And when you know who and whose you are, you will know what to do. When you know who you are, you're going to know what to do, right? So I love that. Last week, we kicked that off, and it's important. But today, in this episode on, of Holy Habits, or on Holy Habits, we're going to learn about this idea, the habit of choosing obedience. Everyone's like, eh, I'm out. I don't want to obey anything, right? That's how our carnal flesh sometimes is, our culture. And we get culturalized by our world sometimes, too. And we need God to shake us up like we are worshiping. Shake up the ground, God. Break off this junk of my life, God. Because I want to I be holy as you call me to be holy. And because you're in me, I want to live this life like you're in me. That's for sure, right? I want to learn about that. And, and so uh, in, our, in our culture and in our world today, our understanding of obedience and authority especially has been so distorted, vastly... Uh, influenced by corrupt maybe politicians, the, the immoral sides of the entertainment that we engage in, the hypocritical religious leaders that sometimes we stumble across by the celebrities and influencers who claim to care more about their fans but really just care about their fortune and fame. And because of all of that, I believe what's happened is even the ideas of obedience and of authority has just really gotten this bad rap, this bad rapport to the point where now when we think about obedience to God, we're submitting to his authority, like there is a sense of hesitation sometimes, isn't there? Maybe even aversion, or what I also say, a resistance to this idea altogether. Yet throughout the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, we call it today, is where we actually find the words to eternal life. The way to abundant life, as Jesus calls it, the way and the pathway, the truth and the logic of Jesus, the, the lifestyle of Jesus that leads us to life to the fullest, as he promises us. Over and over and over again, we see this calling in Scripture as God's people to choose obedience to him rather than obedience to anything else. And I believe that one of the most important things that we have to understand is this, that obedience to God isn't just something that we do to check off the list. It's not just something we do to make ourselves feel better because that's, you know, emotionalism is a lot of what our world's in pursuit of, right? Or to do so that God will love us more. That's legalism. That's a religious habit in some ways. We don't want that other. No, the reason we choose obedience to God is because he is a good and a loving father. That's why we choose obedience to him. And so what I want to do over today, over the next few moments with you is to answer three big questions about choosing obedience. And the first big question, if you're taking notes, is this. And I'm going to give you the first three, and then we're going to go through them. So why should we choose obedience to God? The second big question we are going to unpack is this. What does choosing obedience look like, especially in what does obedience look like when it comes to living with sexual integrity, both in real life and online as followers of Jesus? So we're going to tackle that for real tonight. And lastly, the third big question we'll look at is how do we choose obedience? Like how do we actually really choose obedience in our lives in a really practical day-by-day -day basis? So here we go. Here's the first one. If you're taking notes, I hope you're taking notes. I don't want you to miss out on this revelation that God has for you tonight. Number one is why should we choose obedience to God? Like Why? Should we choose obedience to God? That's what any good kid says. Why? Right? So, and in one sentence, the answer is because obedience to God is so much better than obedience to anyone or anything else. Let me say that again. Because obedience to God is so much better than obedience to anyone or anything else. Mm -hmm. So if you have your Bibles with you, paper or digital, would you let your thumbs and fingers do the swiping and turning to First Peter? 
chapter 1. If you don't have your Bibles with you, we have it up on the screen for you as well. Thank you, Jeremy, for helping us with that today to help you track along with us. 1 Peter 1 and verse 14 says, this is the Apostle Peter talking here, one of the OGs, right? The old guys who was one of the Jesus' original 12 disciples. And he's writing this letter to encourage and to equip the early Christian church community. That's what he's doing here. To remember who... They are, and to remember who they are called to as God's great people, as God's people. So starting in chapter 1 of this letter, verse 14, he says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Like what Peter is telling us here is that we can either choose obedience to God or obedience to my own desires, our own desires. But here's the problem. The obedience to our own desires is that those desires do not actually lead us in the direction that God has actually called us to live most often. So as followers of Jesus, like you got to choose, you got to learn to choose obedience to God so that we can live out holy lives that our holy God has called us to live. Like he called you out, like we say we're talking tonight, worshiping tonight, he called you out of sinfulness, out of a life broken up by sin and shame and to live as unto Christ. Like I ain't living for myself any longer. I'm living a new life. I've been risen to new life. I've had a complete fresh start. I'm born again. I'm a new creation. I'm a new man and new woman. I am born again into Christ and into a family, into his great church and to move. Like it's an amazing thing that God has called us into. Fills us with the Holy Spirit to empower us to live in such a manner. Yet we still choose, friends, out of our own volition, out of our own free will, out of our own willpower, obedience to God or obedience to my desires. The Apostle Peter, he continues in chapter 2 of 1 Peter in the same letter, 1 Peter 2 and 9. Peter goes on to say, you as a follower of Christ, but you are a chosen people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not even a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, Peter's saying to you, I urge you as foreigners and exiles in this world to abstain from sinful desires, which are, what are they doing? They're waging war against your soul. Like Peter's saying here, you got to choose you got to choose obedience, like abstain from sinful desires which have waged war against your soul. Like you got to fight back some days to make the right choice in your life. Like try abstaining from food for a day and see how loud your body gets, right? It gets loud. Try two days and see how much louder it gets. Try three days, right? Get off Netflix and Instagram for more than a week. See how loud your soul gets, Like, oh man, I feel so good because I haven't had to look at anyone else's highlight reels when you get off Instagram for more than a week. I keep comparing myself and feeling sorry for myself when I get stuck on someone else's highlight reel, right? On whatever you're watching. Because I ain't got no boyfriend yet. They be posing with some guy they already broke up with a week later. Peter's saying, you got to choose. you got to choose obedience and like abstain from sinful desires. And he starts out this call to obedience by reminding us of who we are. That's why we started out last week. you got to know who you are in order to know what to do. you got to know who you are. Because when you know who you are in Christ Jesus, you will know what to do. Ain't nobody playing. Right? Like obedience to God or obedience to your own desires. Those are two different kingdoms, by the way. Who's in charge around here, right? Like you got to go all caring on your will sometimes. Who's in charge? i got to file a complaint around here. Who's in charge? How often are we letting our own sinful desires, our broken habits to take charge in our lives? Have you ever noticed that, that um, when you often obey your own sinful desires? I know I've, I've, I've obeyed my own sinful desires in the past, and maybe you've, you've noticed that as well. Sometimes I actually obey the voice of my flesh, the will of my willpower of my body and my bodily cravings or my soul cravings more than I do to God's voice in my life. When we choose obedience to our desires, actually what we are doing without even realizing it is we are waging war on our very souls. 
Like we are choosing, friends, to give up the life and the calling that God has for us, the joy and the peace and the love, the purpose and meaning that he's offering to us. And instead, what we are doing is we are settling for something that is so much less, something that is so empty and something that does not fulfill. So why should we choose obedience to God? And I've got this for you on the screen, I think, because obedience to God is so much more, so much better than obedience to anyone or anything else. There's nothing more important in this world than being walking in fellowship with my God, walking in unity, walking in alignment with God. I want to walk in obedience to God because nothing or no one, anything, nothing else is better. I don't want to settle for anything less than all that God has for me. Question number two, our second big question for you tonight. What does choosing obedience look like? And the more specific More specifically, I believe that this is so important to talk about. How about this? I'm going to rephrase this for us in the room. What does obedience look like when it comes to living with sexual integrity, both in real life and online as Jesus followers, as followers of Jesus? Sexual integrity. If I was to summarize this into one sentence to answer this, what does it look like to choose obedience? It's this. It's choosing to love others the same way that God through Christ has loved us. It's simply choosing to love other people the same way that God through Christ has loved us. And here's what I want to be really specific about or in our context tonight in talking about what does obedience to God rather than my own desires look like when it comes to living with sexual integrity in my life. Since our culture tells us this, that real fulfillment actually comes through sexual fulfillment. You've got to be sexually fulfilled in order to have fulfillment in your life. This is what our culture tells us. So how do I choose obedience to God and my desires in my sexual ethics and in practices, both in real life and online, rather than choosing to obey my desires, obey the common practices and demands of culture, the influences of celebrities and online influencers, Hollywood or Bollywood, whatever which one you look at or watch, politicians, and even today some of our religious leaders who have become more culturalized than biblically informed. Why obey, listen to them as well in my sexual ethics? One of the ways it looks like to choose to love others the same way God through Christ has loved you is by choosing to reserve sex and sexual gratification actually for marriage. While refusing to objectify others, we're going to unpack this a little bit tonight. It's choosing to love others the same way that God, through Christ, has loved us, has loved you. And we do this by choosing to reserve sex and sexual gratification for marriage while refusing to objectify others in our lives. Now, let me talk to you about reserving sex and sexual gratification for marriage. You ready for this tonight? That's why we got the red lights. It's moody now. Mm. (laughs) Thank you, Isaiah, for being creative in that. Like, why is that important, by the way, right? Why is that a part of the Christian sexual ethic? Because we all know that this is very different than what our world tells us today, right? And the reason why this is such a big deal is because sex is a really, really, really powerful thing. Sex outside of marriage causes people to do things, to say things, to think things that they probably wouldn't normally do, say, or think. And when we take something like sex that is so powerful and we put it in the wrong context... It can cause ridiculous amounts of harm and damage both to ourselves and to others. But we're choosing to love others the same way that God through Christ has loved us. Now, some of you hearing this and you're like, nah, I don't buy it, PC. It's harmless. It's just two lovebirds having feelings for each other, exploring and having a good time. But I would urge you to look at our world today and you will actually see the negative consequences of sex in the wrong context. Like, quite literally, think about the world we live in today. If you'll just go along with me for a few minutes without, with the amount of sexually transmitted infections and diseases that there are. Think about the amount of unwanted pregnancies that results in abortions. Think about the, think about the, the, the amount of human trafficking that, that is happening all around the world for enslaved prostitution. Think about the amount of kids who are growing up around the world today without a parent, one of the parents or both parents in the home, whether it be their father or mother or both. Think about the rise of toxic masculinity or the Me Too movement that's showing the negative consequences uh, that, that have come when people have chosen obedience to their sexual desires rather than keeping sex in its proper and God-designed context. And the list goes on and on and on if you were to sit and think for about it for just a couple minutes. And, the re- and I wanted to say this. This is for free. If you're married in here and you're, you're living in a covenant marriage between a man and a woman, 
and you're enjoying that covenant marriage relationship and you're enjoying sexual, I'm ta- also talking about sexual in- our sexual ethics that are outside of the marriage that you, sometimes we might engage yourself in. And we're going to talk about a little bit too, but with pornography, the online world, I want to talk, we're talking about that too. All right, so the reason why the Christian sexual ethic says that sex and sexual gratification is reserved for marriage is because sex is powerful and unfortunately when outside of the protection and the covenant of marriage can oftentimes be a dangerous thing that when used in the wrong context often brings shame, pain, disappointment, and significant harm both to yourself and to those that you're involved with. So what are we doing? We're choosing obedience to, to God's sexual ethics rather than the sex, my sexual desires and keeping sex in its proper and God-designed context. So in Matthew 19, Jesus is actually having a conversation with some guys who are actually trying to catch him in a trap. But in this, it's, it's in this conversation that Jesus actually walks through what marriage between one man and one woman is part of and what it's meant to be. Let's look. I want to help you understand a little bit more why sex is reserved for marriage. Jesus, Jesus is saying here, haven't you read... He replied that at the beginning of the creator made them both male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become, say it with me, one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, I believe it's important to talk about marriage as many don't fully understand the significance of marriage as a a covenant before God. So I want to take a moment to talk about the purpose of marriage. There are three key ideas about the purpose of marriage that I want to share with you, all right? The first one is this. The first key is companionship. Number one, it's not good to be alone. Like marriage is meant to be a place where we are in relationship with another person. Because God, in the very beginning of time, as you remember, in the book of Genesis, the very beginning of the Genesis of time and space, the Bible gives us, gives us an account of God saying that it's not good for man to be alone. Why? Because he's going to play Lego all day. That's why. Or video games, right? It's not good for man to be alone. So part of the purpose of marriage is for us to have relationship and companionship. But even before that, the first command that God gives in the entire Bible is to be fruitful and multiply. Right, so purpose number number two is making babies, baby. Like, be fruitful and multiply. Come on, somebody, married people in the rooms are like, "Amen, praise the Lord." Mm. Amen, honey. Purpose number three. I'm just going to move on from that one. (laughs) Purpose number three, and I believe this is one of the things that we so often miss, but yet is so important for us to understand. The third purpose of marriage. And maybe even the most important part of marriage, actually, is it's a way for us to reflect the relational nature of God, where two become one, both male and female. It's you and me and God, baby. That's more like it. That's why it's so important, friends, to date to marry first off, right? Don't date for recreation. It's not a sport. God's like, hey, what's going on here? You date for marriage, right? (laughs) Like... And while you'll be dating, like I said last week, don't be going places you wouldn't go with grandma. (laughs) Right? You wouldn't be putting your lips or hips or hands with gammy, so save it. You'll be okay, and so will he or she. (laughs) See, when you learn disciplines now, friends, who are in the dating world, doesn't matter what age you might be at, mm -hmm, you'll need to learn discipline. Right? And so when you learn discipline, when your neighbor wants to get cozy with you, when your lovely wife is not around, you're going to know what to do because you've already practiced discipline in your life. When you're depressed and sad and anxious and angry, you're not going to go to the internet to find some lovey-dovey stuff to help you gratify yourself. But instead, you're going to have eyes for that woman of God that God has married you to, right? Or man, whatever, male or female. You'll know what to do, Right? When you learn now, because you learned earlier how to discipline your desires, you've got to learn how to discipline your desires now, young. Because it's not going to go away. Your desire is going to still be there. If you let it grow rampant now, it's going to be rampant later, by the way. My lips and hands and hips, whatever you want to call it, and body are for only one woman. By the way, that includes online too, friends. I want my eyes to be only for one woman too. Right? But also, here's another tip, Captain Tips here tonight. I'm just trying to help someone out here. And, and, and date someone who actually values Jesus being at the center of your relationship. Scripture talks about being unequally yoked or equally yoked, whichever way we look at it. Can you imagine a big old burly ox? That's not the man, that's the woman. I'm just kidding. 
a big old burly ox tethered and yoked to a, a little goat. I don't know if you need any farmers in the room. And, and you got to plow a field. Like, you're like, what? Like, if you know anything about farming, you know this is going to be complicated. Right? Or goats and bulls. You ain't going anywhere, t- anywhere anytime soon. You end up going around in circles chasing your tail, right? And, and the relationship actually becomes exhausting. And by the way, and sometimes you actually, when you're unequally yoked, one actually end up, ends up carrying the spiritual weight more than the other. And that, that gets challenging. Those are things you've got to work through. And before you know it, like I said, your relationship begins to get exhausting. But, but by the way, if, if you're married and you be here and not be you, it's not game over either, right? It, it's not meant to be separated what God has put together. But you both are going to have some work to do. You're both going to have to have some hard conversations about it. You've got to have some hard. You can be, uh, you can still be, if you're a Christian and you're married to an unbeliever or whatever that might look like, you can still actually be a reflection of Christ in that relationship so that you might also win them to faith as well, right? So through your faithfulness to God and to your spouse, you just might win them for Jesus. And that's a beautiful thing to be able to have an opportunity to do if that's where you are. That's for free. But the third purpose of marriage is to reflect the relational nature of God is what we're talking about. And here's what I mean by this. In the beginning, God created human beings, and he created male and female. He created them in his image. And so with men and women, each of them are actually made in the image of God. Right? And the thing is, like men and women, mm, they're kind of different, right? In a few different ways. They're not the exact same as you might have noticed, but they're meant to fit together to complement one another. Yet both of them are made in the very image of God. Each one of them is actually reflecting the different aspects of God's nature in that union and in that covenant and in that relationship. When two become one in a covenant relationship, it's a promise. It's like, till death do us part, baby. And sometimes you want to take those words back, but you can't (laughs) because it's covenant between you and God. And like, I'm going to honor this. I'm I'm going to learn something, God. What are you trying to teach me in this situation? It's about humility so often in our relationships too. But when the two become one in a covenant relationship, they start to show us another aspect of God's nature. Because the God of the Bible, the God of creation, the God of Christianity is a relational God. We believe in the, in the eternal existence of, of one true God who is revealed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the very nature of our God is absolutely relational. And so when the two become one, what we see is another aspect of God being reflected in our marriages. His relational nature. Marriage is a Christian concept, by the way. It's a covenant between one man and one woman before God, often witnessed by other people who hold them accountable to that relationship, right? Marriage is meant to be a picture, though, of our relational God. This is beautiful. So let me give you an illustration for how this might work. Let's go Iron Man. Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, Hulk, they all got their own story, right? Their own movie, even. They each kind of big and celeb already, right? The main characters. And in their own movies, you see different aspects of who they are as heroes, right? Like what they stand for, what their bend is, how they fight, what their character is. But when they all join together as the Avengers... All of a sudden, you see a different aspect and sides of each of those heroes. Like, you begin to discover more about who they are when they're in relationship with one another. Like, working together as a team, you see things that you just don't see when you are on your own or when they are on their own. That's exactly what marriage is supposed to be. Maybe not just like the Avengers. That's cool, but I ain't saying you got to do cosplay either, by the way. All kind of weird, but, you know, you, you just get my point here, right? It's this idea of when the different parts come together as a whole, you will see a more complete picture. You see a different angle. And it's the same way with what it means to be human and the character of our God. It's through relationship. It's through coming together. Marriage is beautiful. It's a picture, an illustration, and reflecting the the relational nature of God. And we begin to understand more of what it means to be made in his image. By the way, quick note, while marriage is a really, really good thing, it's not the most important thing. So if you're single, singleness is not brokenness. I I want you to understand that tonight, right? Singleness is not brokenness. So if you're 21 and you're in a hurry to get married, hey, you're not broken. Don't worry about it. Trust God. Ask God to bring someone by, right? Your life, you know, "Mm, honey. Anyway, marriage is a good thing, but it's not the most important thing. What we got to understand here is that sex and marriage 
are not requirements for a meaningful and fulfilled life. Like Jesus was single and celibate, by the way. That means he never had sex and he wasn't married. And so if you think that those are actually requirements, then basically what you're saying is that Jesus didn't live a meaningful life, which is a crazy thing to think. Right? So, yes, marriage is a really, really good thing, and sex is great, and God made it up, and he designed it, but it's not the most important thing. So that's, that's the purpose of marriage. Three ideas, companionship, making babies, and the reflected nature of our relational God. Beautiful. Choosing obedience to God, though, means choosing to love others the same way God, through Christ, has loved you by reserving sex for marriage and refusing to objectify others. Now, let's talk about that. We talked about saving sex for marriage. Let's talk about objectifying others. It's also a really big deal to Jesus. In Matthew 5 and 27, Jesus said this, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. Apocalyptic, right? Like, Jesus was pretty serious, I think, here about lust. But why do you think this is the case? And I believe it's... Because Jesus understands, and I've got this for you as well, write this down, that lust is actually choosing your desires over someone else's dignity. Mm -hmm. That was a good one. Lust is choosing your desires over someone else's dignity. Like Jesus is actually helping us to understand here that every time we lust, what we are doing is we are training ourselves to see others and objects for our own gratification, for our own pleasure, rather than seeing them as people who are to be loved as Christ has loved us. Like that girl be made in the image of God, bro. Loved by God, a child of God who has purpose and identity and destiny from God. Why would I want to get up in her business and destroy her dignity and, and objectify that girl when I can see her as a child of God and someone who has dignity before God? It's not cho- lust is choosing my desires over someone else's dignity. What Jesus understands is that lust leads us to objectify others. Human beings who have been made in the image of God, who have dignity, friends, who have value, and who have kingdom purposes, just like you. Human beings that Jesus actually died for and that we have been called to serve and to love. But when we lust, what we're doing is we selfishly see them as objects. And that's literally literally what it means to objectify somebody else. And listen, friends, to objectify someone is actually just a nice way of saying dehumanize them. Scripture also rebukes a generation that becomes lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. And I believe that when we resist lust and objectification of others for our own selfish sexual gratification, we can instead spend that same energy in some ways to turn our full attention and and to submit our desires to God and our motivations to God as he can deeply be the fulfillment that we actually need. Rather than believing that your best lived life is a sexually fulfilled life. You hear me? You good? If we are followers of Christ, then we are called to live holy lives to represent a holy God. Then it requires us to see people the same way that God sees them. Not as objects for our pleasure, but as people to be loved. So we've talked about why we should choose obedience because obedience to God is so much better than obedience to anyone or anything else, right? We've talked about what obedience actually looks like. It's choosing to love others the same way that God through Christ has loved us, reserving sex and sexual gratification for marriage and refusing to objectify others. Big, long story already. Now let's talk about the third big question. You ready for the next big question? Here it is. How do we choose obedience? Why, what, and how? How do we choose it? Like it's one thing to talk about it. Take some notes, go home, put it on your dresser, and do nothing about it. That's poor stewardship, by the way. It's a whole other level to actually do it, to act upon it, to take action. I get it. And this is where it can be really difficult for us as human beings. So I want to help you. I want to help you. That's what I get to do. I love it. I get to equip you with tangible tools to help you champion your faith journey here on earth, right? So I want to give you some tips because I'm Captain Tips tonight to help you choose obedience, to actually live this out. Ready? If you're still taking notes, the first one is this tip number one for you. Stop trying and start training. Stop trying and start training. Like, you got to stop trying so hard and start training for it instead. I mean, I've never balked or cut or ran a 10-mile race by just trying. No, I had to actually start training myself. And it takes your investment of time and energy and even finances sometimes. You get a membership and you hire a coach and a nutritionist. You plan, you exercise, you train, you execute, get to it. Like, you ain't going to get to the Olympics 
sitting on your couch eating Doritos. You're not going to win at a match or life, by the way, if that's what, how you live your life. If you aren't training, you've got to train. Stop trying and start training. It's also why the practices of prayer and fasting and worship and Bible studying are so important to your success even here on earth. It's being intentional. It's training. I'm not just trying where we're going to church once on Sunday and waiting to next Sunday. That's trying, by the way. So if that's all you're doing, you're starving yourself spiritually. Fasting and praying and having a diet of spiritual formation is what we need. It's being intentional. It's purpose-filled. Like you might be stressed and depressed because like you keep trying and you keep failing at these things in your life and finances and relationships. Everything's a mess. God, jobs and faith. And I quit because you haven't learned to train. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9 and 26. Is so I run with purpose in every... Paul was... He was I'm sure he was... Um, I don't know what you'd say about Paul. Very fixated probably, right? Like, I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. Like, I discipline my body, right? Like an athlete training it to do what it should do. Like, Paul isn't saying, hey, PC, just try to do what is right. Just do your best. Right? But he's actually saying, I try to do what's right, to do what I should. No, I train myself to do what I should. I don't just try. I'm training myself in it. Disciplining, I, I, you know, I've got coaches to help me in my life. I have pastors to help in my life, and I, you know, I personally have overseers in my life to help me train, to train me up in the way I should grow. Fathers and mothers in the house who train us up with the help of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, so that I can do what I should. So, first tip: How do I choose obedience? First thing: Stop trying to start training. Here's the second one. Second tip for us: Eliminate temptations today. So you don't have to resist them tomorrow. Like you got to be examining yourself. You already know in your life, every one of you in this room already know where you keep submitting yourself to temptation, right? Every one of us already knows this. This isn't new news. You got to examine yourself, right? But, But here's what you can do. You can actually choose to eliminate temptations in your life. And here's what I would say. I would be ruthless with it, by the way. Stop giving yourself permission to fall into temptation just because I'm such a human. Come on, the Holy Spirit's in you who has empowered, like, resurrected Jesus from the dead, spoke light in earth and everything into existence. Can you imagine? It's just you, bro. You're just choosing the wrong decision. <laughs> Eliminate temptations today so you don't have to resist them tomorrow. Choose to be ruthless because uh, it's messed up your life, by the way. So eliminate temptations today so you don't have to resist them tomorrow. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6. Paul says this, flee <laughs> from sexual immorality, right? Like, don't just resist it, but flee from it. Run! All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever whoever sins sexually sins against their own body, their own temple, right? It's like, run! One of the most helpful things you can do, friends, is to lock down your smartphones. Maybe that might help you run a little bit differently. Like, make it so that you cannot even, even have access to websites or images if that's your situation. Or videos that you and I both know are not the images that you need to be looking at or the videos you need to be watching. And there are some of you here in the room who might be wrestling with an addiction to pornography or, or anything pornographic because it's not just porn. Instagram is just as much pornographic material on it, by the way, nowadays. And yet you've tried over and over. And I keep trying, PC, to resist the temptation. Flee! <laughs> Find a way to restrict yourself from having access to it. Others of you, you and maybe your girlfriend or boyfriend, you've been crossing some lines that you know that you shouldn't be crossing. Or maybe you didn't know, but now you know. Like, don't wait until you're making out at grandma's house to try and resist the temptation of going any further. Have a conversation today. Set some boundaries. And, and this goes for you married folks as well. Like, if you've been hanging out with some other one's wife at the soccer game, come on, you need to set some boundaries in your life again. Right? It's like... It's okay to do that. Set some boundaries in place to help you choose obedience. So firstly, stop trying, start training. Secondly, eliminate those temptations today so that you don't have to resist them tomorrow. Here's a third thing. Tip three, get help. <laughs> like, we're humans. We need help. You can't do it alone, right? If everyone around you is struggling, with, oh, here's what I need. You can't do life alone. We've already talked about this. You need good people around you who can help you. By the way, if everyone around you is struggling with the same temptations, they probably ain't going to be much help to you. That's just like two blind people going into a ditch together. 
and then you're talking about it once you're there. It's like, who can, find some real accountability in your life. Talk to someone who's going to actually hold you accountable, right? Who you're going to be a little bit kind of nervous to talk about with because you're like, oh my goodness, what are they going to, oh, oh, like find that person to talk to, right? Like maybe a grandma or maybe a pastor or maybe whatever. You need some champions around you. And if you're trying to get clean from porn addictions or addiction to self-gratification, find someone who has actually already championed getting clean and freed for the last five years or 10 years or 30 years. You need some maturity in that. The blind cannot help the blind. You will fall in the ditch. You need someone who has sight to help guide the blind. Make sense? Galatians 6 and 2 says this. We need each other's help, so carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. See, as followers of Christ... We were never meant to live life alone, to do life or ministry alone, like we say here at Beloved. You were never meant to face your temptations, your circumstances, your pain. You were never meant to go through life on your own. And for some of you, maybe tonight when you get home from church, or even right before you leave church tonight, you got to talk to your parents. you got to ask a mentor. you got to talk to somebody. Ask for advice. Maybe for, for others of you, you're going to talk to your city group leader instead and, and say, hey, this is where I've been struggling, and I need your help. Will you help pray for me? I've been hiding this in my life, and it's killing me because I know it's not right. Maybe it's a trusted friend. Maybe, again, as I mentioned, a pastor. Maybe you're here and, and you don't even have community in your life, and this is your first time in a church community, and I want you to know that, that you desperately need people in your life that you can do life with, that you can share your life with. You can share both your junk and your celebrations, right? So you can celebrate the wins and deal with your junk together, you're confessing your sins one to another. That's how you find healing in your life. That's how you find fruit. That's why we do city groups. So you can actually do that. There's a space for it. We make that. You curate it. Stop pretending we don't, <laughs> right? Jump in a small group. We totally believe that this is best done at Beloved by being part of a city group where we can pray together, do life together, go deeper in our faith together. We can receive pastoral care together. We want to help you get connected. That's what we want to do. So make sure you stop by the What's Next booth. This is my advertisement for you in the lobby. Get plugged into a small group. None of us were meant to do life alone. And it's actually probably going to be the biggest help that you could ever ask for where you have real meaningful accountability in your life where you talk about these things. So this is how we actually choose obedience to God. We must stop trying and start training. Secondly, we eliminate temptations today so that we don't have to resist them tomorrow. And thirdly, we get help. You. Let me put this up on the slide. I've got to slide this for you. You, as a follower of Jesus, you have been called to live a holy life to represent a holy God. That's what you've been called. As a follower of Jesus, you have committed. You have been called to live. You are responding by you say, yes, Jesus. You are now living a holy life to represent a holy God. It's not about you anymore. That looks very different from the people around you where you live, work, play, and study because in our sex-crazed culture, choosing to live by a Christian sexual ethic is going to be weird to people. I remember when I was saying, you're what? You're saving what for marriage? Are you kidding me? Like, have you ever been to a car lot? You don't just drive one car. you got to drive them all before you decide what car you want to buy. That's the kind of conversations we have in our sex-crazed culture. But I'm telling you, friend, friends, it's, it's worth it because obedience to God is so much better than obedience to anyone or anything else. Because obedience to God leads us to life. It leads us to freedom. It leads us to meaningful lived lives, to purpose-filled lives, to joy that so many people in our world are absolutely desperate for. And when you, when you choose to represent your holy God by living a holy and set apart, like you ain't that girl anymore. You're set apart. What you will be is you will be a light in the darkness for so many people that are going through life wishing for something more, wishing for something better, and you have it in you, and they want what you have. So stop giving yourself and surrendering yourself to the ethics of this world, be the culturalization of our world, and stand out, be different, be set apart, because you are chose to live a holy life to represent a holy God. Because our God is the author of life to the fullest. He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And, and here's what he says. He says that anybody who comes to him will find life and life to the fullest. All around the room, I ask you to just posture yourself in prayer for a moment.